So today uh, we're going to start uh, the next topic for our introduction to security class and uh, the topic that we're doing today is uh, cryptography, specifically symmet uh, symmetric uh, cryptography. So let's start. So before delving into the details, so what is cryptography? So whenever we talk about security or like when, whenever we think of these terms, uh, basically what comes to mind is cryptography. Why? Because cryptography is essentially the science of hiding information in plain sight. So in order to conceal it from unauthorized parties. So cryptography is the process of transforming data so that it appears to be gibberish, right? Except to those who know some kind of a key or who know how to read that data. So today, uh, cryptography-based uh, systems are mandatory to protect email, corporate data, personal information, and electronic transactions. Now, is this a new concept? No. Uh, encryption essentially dates back through the ages. So the truth is that as long as there have been people, there have been secrets. So one early system that was used by the ancient Greeks and the Spartans is called Cytel, which is S-C-Y-T-A-L-E, Cytel, right? So this system functioned essentially by wrapping a strip of uh, papyrus around a rod of fixed diameter on which a message was written. So if anyone intercepted the paper, it appeared as meaningless letters. So even Julius Caesar encrypted messages sent between himself and his trusted advisors. So although many uh, might not consider it like a robust method of encryption, but Caesar's cipher worked by means of a simple substitution cipher. So as you can see on the slide, so in Caesar's cipher, there was a plain text alphabet and a cipher text alphabet. So alphabets were arranged like as, as this table right here. Right, so instead of an A, you would substitute a D. Instead of a K, you would substitute an N. Right? So when Caesar was set, ready to send a message, it was encrypted by moving the text forward according to this key, like or A key. So if the key was three characters, the word cat would appear as or be encrypted as FDW. Right? So you can try to do this yourself. Uh, looking at this figure So what you need to do is like look up each of the messages letters in the top row and write down the corresponding letter in the bottom row and this type of cipher is called a rotation cipher Okay, and the key is three or three characters or it's called uh, Rot three that it's rotating by three Okay so ancient Hebrews also used like a cryptography based system called Atbash that worked by replacing each letter used with another letter the same distance away from the end of the alphabet. So A was sent as a Z, B was sent as a Y and so on Okay, as shown in this uh, second part of the figure like this bottom figure. Okay. So encryption essentially means uh, is like a means to allow two parties uh, on the slide it's Alice and Bob to establish a confidential communication channel over an insecure channel that is subject to eavesdropping by this Eve. So this um, communication channel essentially is insecure but encryption makes it appear as secure so that anybody uh, who can listen to that insecure channel is not able to decipher what's happening inside uh, this communication channel. So that's the basic purpose of encryption as I'm sure most of you know. Okay. So just like some formal definitions, what is plain text? So the message that needs to be sent is called plain text. And when that message is encrypted, it's called a ciphertext. And then the ciphertext goes to the other side, uh, to the receiver or the recipient, 
and it needs to be decrypted okay so essentially uh, the equations come of this form uh, like a sender or like si you receive the cipher cipher text based on encrypting the original message m and when that uh, uh, cipher text is sent it needs to be decrypted which this d stands for to get the original message m okay so these encryption and decryption algorithms they are essentially uh, usually they are um, uh, open knowledge meaning that uh, anybody can know that okay this person these two people are using this algorithm the essential key that's uh, or the essential information that helps protect a, an encrypted channel or encrypted information is the key size or the key that is used to encrypt or decrypt uh, a message okay because this cipher text can be transmitted over like I said an insecure channel which can be eavesdropped by the adversaries so the whole uh, uh, possible set of cipher text, plain text, uh, encryption keys, decryption keys, uh, the algorithm used to encrypt, the algorithm used to decrypt, the correspondence between the encryption and the decryption keys, all this is called a crypto system or cryptographic system. Okay, so this system is, is mainly divided into two uh, you can say fields of studies one is called symmetric crypto systems and the others are public crypto systems or asymmetric crypto systems so today we are only going to look at symmetric crypto systems so in a crypto system that uses symmetric cryptography the sender and receiver use two instances of the same key okay that are used for encryption and decryption as shown in this figure. So the key ha basically has a dual functionality in that it can carry out both these encryption and decryption processes. So symmetric keys are also called secret keys. Okay, why? Because this type of encryption relies on each user to keep the key a secret and properly protected. So if an intruder were to get this key then this system would just simply fall apart and the message could easily be intercepted, deciphered and so on. Okay. So as you can see in the figure, it's one key that is used to encrypt the original message from the sender sent over an insecure communication channel represented by these two lines, which can be eavesdropped by an attacker, right? And at the receiver side or the recipient side, the decryption function, whatever that is, is used by the same key, okay, to get the original plain text. So the point being same key, hence symmetric, it's one key that is used by the sender and the receiver, okay. Now what comes to mind? So since it's one key that is shared by the sender and the receiver okay how do they uh, exchange this key right so that is the biggest problem in symmetric cryptography that how do senders and receivers distribute these keys with each other right because if the key is known the whole system falls apart so if the key is sent let's say to somebody um, across the internet which is an insecure channel how do we send it? That's the first question. If you say, uh, we will just, just send it, what does that mean? That means that you're just exposing a secret key to any of the eavesdroppers, right? So if the eavesdroppers can get the same key, then does not matter you, the next message that you send uh, encrypted with that key, 
will just be as useless as sending it as plain text, right? The key distribution is the biggest problem in symmetric key distribution. The other problem is um, that for two individuals or two parties, you would need separate keys. So for instance, Alice and Bob will have one secret key, which is shared between these two. Bob and somebody else, let's say Stephanie, will have their own key and so on. So each two parties interacting with each other will have their own shared or secret key. Okay? Which makes the, um, one, the process slow, insecure, and uh, there are n times n minus 1 over 2 keys, right? Since there are, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4 people involved, so 4 times 3, 12 over 2, you need 6 keys, okay? If there was another person involved, you will have uh, like 5 times 420 divided by 2, uh, 10 keys, okay? Because that person needs to have or we need to manage uh, like more communications channel or more secret, secret keys, okay? So uh, there are basically two general approaches uh, uh, for attacking a, uh, a symmetric encryption system or uh, symmetric cryptography. The first is known as uh, crypt analysis or crypt analysis, and the second is known as brute force attacks. Okay, in the first one in uh, Crypt analytic attacks, they rely on the nature of the algorithm plus perhaps some knowledge of the general characteristics of the plain text. Or even in some cases, some sample plain text to ciphertext pairs. Right? So this type of attack basically exploits the characteristics of the algorithm, which is used to attempt to deduce a specific plain text or to deduce the key that is being used. Okay, If the attack succeeds in deducing the key, again, the effect is catastrophic. Why? Because all the future and past messages that are encrypted with the key can be compromised. Right? In known plain text type of attacks, so in this type of attack, uh, the crypt analyst has a block of plain text and a corresponding blocks of well, block of ciphertext. The goal of a known plain text attack is to determine the cryptographic key and possibly the algorithm, which can then be used to decrypt the other messages. Then, like uh, chosen plain text or ciphertext attacks, um, so the crypt analyst has the subject of the attack unknowingly encrypt chosen blocks of uh, data, uh, in turn creating a result that the crypt analyst can then analyze. So the goal of these types of attacks is to determine the cryptography uh, key or cryptographic key, which can then be used to decrypt other messages. Okay. Then like the aim of the uh, uh, brute force attack is to try like every possible key on a piece of ciphertext until some intelligent translation into the plain text can be obtained. So the most straightforward attack on an encrypted message is simply to attempt uh, to decrypt the message without or sorry uh, with every possible key. So most of these attempts will fail, obviously, because you don't know the key or that that is not the exact key, but one might work, right? So at that point, you can decrypt the message and any others uh, that the key is used on. So there is no way to defend against a key search attack 
because there is no way to keep an attacker from trying to decrypt your message with every possible key. Right? However, key searches are not efficient. Right? Because if the chosen key's length is long enough, a key search attack is not even feasible. For instance, with a 128-bit key, 128 bits that is, and remember a bit is a zero or a one, right? So 128 bits or 128 combinations of zeros and ones, and any conceivable uh, computing technology, life on Earth will usually cease to exist long before even a single key is likely to be cracked. So that's how uh, many combinations there are, right? So on average, half of all possible keys must be tried to achieve success. Why? Because that is like if there are X different keys, on average, an attacker would discover the actual key after half of the tries or x divided by two tries. Okay, So there is more to a brute force attack than simply running through all possible keys unless known plain text is provided. right? Because unless the plain text is provided, the analyst must be able to recognize plain text as plain text. So if the message is just plain text in English, then the result pops out easily, right? However, the task of recognizing the English language would have to be automated. If the text message has been compressed before encryption, then recognition is even more difficult. And if the message is some uh, more general type of data, right, such as a numerical file, um, and this has to be then compressed, then the problem becomes even more difficult to automate. Because how do you know the what is a number and whether the number was in that place or there was a letter originally and so on, right? So to supplement the brute force attack or the brute force approach, some degree of knowledge about the expected plain text is needed, usually. And some means of automatically distinguishing plain text from garbage or garble or gibberish is also needed okay so this slide is basically showing you that substitution cipher right so here we have a rot 13 so a is rotated to 13 characters which is this so the 13th character after a is n and so on Okay, so a message which is hello becomes U R Y Y B. Okay, uh, so rod thirteen is um, you can say a favored approach in some of the internet posts. Just to show you. Then, like I said, letters in the natural language like English are not. Uh, also not uniformly distributed um, like some letters occur more in some texts as compared to others so this is like the type of knowledge or the type of information that you need to have with some kind of brute force attack okay for instance in the adventures of Tom Sawyer the book uh, the A appears 8% of the time J appears 0.19% of the time, and so on. Okay. Uh, so knowledge of these letter frequencies, uh, pairs and triples of these letters occurring together can be used in these types of attacks against substitution ciphers. Okay. Then substitutions are not only like of this form where a letter is substituted for another letter. Okay. Uh, you can substitute uh, numbers, you can substitute uh, letters against numbers, you can substitute uh, on binary numbers and so on. So the essential thing which is called, uh, or which is taken into account, or which is like the formal definition is something of a substitution box. Okay. Um, 
So a 4-bit substitution box for a 0000, 0, 0, 0 is 0, 0, 1, 1. So instead of 0000, 0, 0, 0, you write 1, 1. And then for 0, 0, 0, 0001, you write 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. So there are 4 bits. And you can imagine you can increase it to 5 bit, 6 bit, 8 bit, and so on. So whatever the number of bits. So a zero, which is like all zeros would appear as a 0011, which is like the decimal notation is 3. So as 1, like 0, 0, 0, 0001, three zeros and a 1 is a 1, is converted to an 8, and so on. Okay? So there is one type of uh, substitution cipher that is unbreakable and that involves something called padding. So it is called a one-time pad. So originally invented in uh, 1917. So in this technique we use a block of shift keys or like, like uh, a plain text essentially is paired with a random secret key which is called a one-time pad then each bit or character of the plain text is encrypted by combining it with the corresponding bit or character from that pad using modular addition okay um, in other cases you can XOR it and it and so on like if you remember your logic gates but in this case, you use modular addition. So if the key is truly random and is at least as long as the plain text and it is never used or reused in whole or in part and is kept completely secret, then the resulting ciphertext is impossible to decrypt or break. Okay? Why? Because the key size is random, one, then it is as long as the plain text and then when you do modular addition on each character the new um, or each time you decrypt using a new random key the result will be different each time right so that's why it's impossible to decrypt however like these one times pads have their weaknesses, which is like I said earlier, the key has to be as long as uh, the plain text, right? Um, keys can never be reused, like I said earlier, in order to keep. Why? Because repeated use of a one time pad allowed us, the US, to break some of the communications of the Soviet spies during the Cold War and this is an actual top secret memo that was decrypted okay so the uh, most commonly used metric encryption algorithms are block ciphers so block cipher processes uh, the plain text input in fixed size called structures called blocks and produces a block of ciphertext of equal size for each plain text block. Okay, the algorithm processes longer plain text amounts as a series of fixed size blocks. Okay, now you can imagine why the problem arises that if let's say your fixed size blocks end, like your message ends and you have nothing in, but your block size is fixed then you need to have some kind of extra bits to cover or complete that block. Okay? And this, um, or these extra bits to complete the block are called pads. Okay? So again, each message is divided into sequence of blocks and each block is encrypted or using a key. Uh, so your end message or your final message which is encrypted is a combination of these blocks and since the block size is fixed as like 128 bits 256 bits and so on 
if your blog uh, if your message finishes but block size is still or block is still empty you need to have some kind of padding to finish the block okay uh, and what this is what this slide is saying that uh, they require length n of plain text to be multiple of block size b and so on okay uh, and you can read this by the way, so the details or the exact maths of these techniques we are not going to concern about or we are not concerned in this class. Why? Because this is an introductory class. So we are not going to talk about like what uh, the exact math is behind all these techniques. But just to give you an overview of these things so you know what they mean essentially. Okay. So that's the purpose of this course. Um, then these are like some of the most important symmetric algorithms that are out there that you should be familiar with or just know not knowing them in detail like how a triple des uh, works or like how it encrypts information what the exact maths again like i said earlier we are not concerned about those but you should know that uh, des is a symmetric encryption right a scheme triple des and what is aes so you sh when you see these things you should know what they are okay so that's the purpose the first one was uh, des established back in 1977 uh, the 64-bit blocks and 56-bit keys were used okay uh, because the key space was small um, Exhaustive key search attacks were feasible in the 90s. Why is that? Only in the 90s because before the 90s the computing power was not enough. But by the 90s our computing power was enough that we could crack these kind of keys. So then we jumped to uh, longer length keys. Okay. So then triple DES was uh, invented. Like how it's different from DES like I said earlier. We're not concerned about. But there are three different keys used in DES, with each key being 168 bits. Okay. Uh, then since 2001, AES is the accepted standard. NIST is a standard body in the US. Uh, and there are like 128 bit blocks, and key lengths are various starting from 128 to 192 256 bits uh, are available okay and these days AES 256 is the algorithm of choice when we talk about symmetric cryptography okay maybe one day if this uh, is crackable maybe we'll have to move to a 512 bit and so on okay but until now uh, this is the uh, or a safe option I wouldn't say the safest option, but it is one of the safest, one of the safest. Uh, and this slide is just uh, uh, to give you an idea of these systems or like how they relate to each other, what's different. Uh, so the key size um, lengths you can see in DES uh, was 56, then it jumped to 112 or 168 and AES has longer key sizes and block sizes have uh, jumped up to 128 as well in AES. And then you can see the time required uh, at these many decryptions per microsecond. If you remember your units, um, milli, micro, like all those units, so in a microsecond, 10 to the power 13 decryptions if the computer is so fast that it can do those in a microsecond still it will take these many years to decrypt a message with a 256 bit key now for the sake of the test or the exam i do not uh, expect you to remember all these numbers but at least you should know these numbers or should be able to know uh, what these things mean okay So AES, we'll just look at it uh, briefly. 
because it is like uh, the technology of choice uh, or the encryption standard these days. So this slide is basically like the history of AES, like what it did. Um, so in 90s, like I said earlier, uh, the DES, triple DES were uh, breakable. So NIST issued a call for proposals. Um, like for a new encryption standard. Uh, and now we call it like advanced encryption standard. It was uh, selected. Um, like for 15 algorithms were, were accepted. A second round then narrowed to five algorithms. People proposed them, scientists proposed them. And uh, uh, in, uh, I think, uh, 2001, they accepted uh, an algorithm, which is, I think, uh, Rindale algorithm, it's called, as the proposed AES algorithm was selected. Uh, so the key size, like I said earlier, varies between 128, 192, or 256 bits. Input is a block size of 128 bits. The algorithm works with a chosen key of whatever length, and then you get an output of 128 bits. So there is an exact math behind it that the book, I think, uh, shares with you. Uh, you can look at it, uh, but just like an overview, it has 10 rounds. And if you see um, at each round, uh, there is a key. So that key is used. You XOR uh, the information with, uh, with that key. In the first round, you get X0. Uh, sorry, in the, in the pre-round, you get X0. And in the first round, you X or this information again with the key, you get an output called X1. You again X or with the same key and so on. So after 10 rounds, you will get your ciphertext. So from plain text to ciphertext, you have 10 steps. At each step, the same key is used uh, to X or and uh, then the result is used in the uh, next round and so on, okay? Uh, so each round is uh, basically uh, built from four steps, right? Uh, um, so for it, it works first by putting the 128-bit block of plain text into four by four matrix. Uh, like a four by four matrix where each of these uh, is the block size those 128 bits right so the matrix is termed as a state that will change as the algorithm proceeds through the steps so the first step is to convert the plain text block into binary and then put into a matrix okay as shown here so once you have the original text in binary uh, placed in this matrix form, the algorithm consists of a few relatively simple steps that are used uh, during various rounds, okay, which are these steps. An XOR step, then a substitution step, a permutation step, a matrix multiplication step, and so on. So SBOX, what is an SBOX? SBOX is basically a hard-coded lookup table, okay? Now, what the substitution step is, how the permutation step works, and so on, again, we're not concerned about those in this class. So there are like some common modes that affect how a symmetric cipher works. Uh, so block cipher mode basically describes the way a block cipher encrypts and decrypts a sequence of message blocks. The most common encryption mode is the electronic code book mode or ECB. So what happens here is like the message is divided into blocks and each block is uh, uh, encrypted separately like we have seen until now. So the plain text 
is divided into these P1, P2 through Pn. Again, the whole plain text message. Each block is encrypted separately to get your ciphertext in the end. Okay, C1, C2 to Cn. It should be Cn here. And then those Cs can be encrypted to get the original uh, Ps. Okay. So the problem is that if you submit the same plain text more than once, you always get the same ciphertext. Why is that? Because the key stays the same and the block size is the same. So each time you run the same plain text, you will get the same ciphertext, right? Now this gives the attackers a place to begin analyzing the cipher to attempt to derive the key. So crypt analyst may be able to exploit regu regularities in the plain text to ease the task of this decryption. For example, if it is known that the message always starts out with the certain predefined fields, then the crypt analyst may have a number of known plain text to uh, ciphertext pairs with which he or she can work, right? So put in another way, ECB is basically simply using the cipher exactly as it is described uh, without attempts to improve its security. Okay. And like the strengths and weaknesses of the ECB, this type of mechanism, strengths, it's simple, allows for parallel encryption, like these steps can be doing in, can be done in parallel. Each block of code is being encrypted in parallel, makes it faster, can tolerate the loss or damage of a block. Like if one block gets damaged, you can re-encrypt it, right? Or if it's lost during sending, you can re-encrypt that one block and send it again, okay? However, like images, etc., are not suitable for encryption. And in the exercise that we are going to do, like in the lab, we will see something like this. Okay. Then the other type of mode uh, is called the CBC mode, cipher blockchaining mode. Here, each block of plain text is XORed with the previous block before being encrypted. So this means there is significantly more randomness in the final ciphertext, making it, uh, making it like much more secure than the ECB. And it is the one of the most common modes that is used. Okay. So there is no good reason to use ECB over CBC. If both ends of the communication support CBC, then we should be using CBC. Okay. Why? Because it's using the older ciphertext and um, combining it with plain text and so on. However, the only issue with CBC is the very first block. Okay. Why? Because there is no preceding block of ciphertext to XOR it with. Right. So what we do in this case is something called an initialization vector. So the initialization vector is basically a pseudo random number, much like a cipher key or like a secret key. Um, usually an initialization vector is only used once and thus it's called a nonce. Like nonce stands for number only used, uh, sorry, number uh, used only once. Okay. So the CBC uh, mode has been there since I think uh, 70s, some like in the mid 70s, it was invented by IBM. Again, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, strengths does not show patterns in the plain text. Again, it's the most common mode. It's fast and relatively simple. Uh, however, it requires that reliable transmission of all the blocks because they have to be in sequence because the previous block is used for the next encryption or decryption. 
It's not suitable for applications that allow packet losses. So packet loss you might have experienced like while you're watching an online video or like a DVD or like Blu-ray, those dots like ch -ch 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 it says and those uh, like those green dots appear in the screen. What hap is ha essentially happening is that some packets are getting lost out of video uh, transmission. Now for, for music and video it does not make a big difference. Why? Because we can still see the picture, we can still understand what's happening. right? So that lost data or lost package, packets don't concern us much. However, for financial data, or like top secrets, uh, like government information, if some piece of information is lost, it can have catastrophic effects. right? So for those applications that do not allow these packet losses, CBC is probably uh, not suitable. Okay. Then this slide just shows you that Java has AES encryption. Also, like you can use different types of functions and so on. Uh, should you be familiar with it? Not necessarily if you don't know Java. If you work with Java, yes, uh, you can use these functions. But just to let you know. Okay, so up until now we have seen something called block ciphers, right? So you understand that we encrypt information in blocks, okay? So a block cipher processes input one block of element at a time, producing an output block for each input block. A stream cipher, a new term, on the other hand, processes the input elements continuously, like a stream is flowing, right? producing output one element at a time as it goes along. So all the block ciphers are far more common. There are certain applications in which stream cipher is more appropriate. Okay. So typical stream cipher encrypts plain text one byte at a time. Again, byte is eight bits. Eight bits make a byte. So although a stream cipher may be designed to operate one bit at a time or on units larger than a byte at a time. Um, like in this structure, a key is input into a pseudo random uh, generator that produces a stream of eight bit numbers that are apparently random. So a pseudo ra random stream is one of those uh, that is unpredictable without the knowledge of the input key and which has an apparently random character. Okay. So the output of the generator, which is called a key stream, is combined one byte at a time with the plain text stream uh, using the bitwise exclusive OR or XOR operation. So with a properly designed pseudo random number generator, a stream cipher can be as secure as a block cipher <clears throat> of comparable key length. So the primary advantage of a stream cipher is that stream ciphers are almost always faster and use far less code than do block ciphers. Then the advantage of a block cipher is that you can reuse keys. And for applications that require encryption decryption of a stream of data such as over like data communications channel or browsers or web links, a stream cipher may be the better alternative. So for applications that deal with blocks of data, such as file transfer, email, database, etc., uh, blocks may be more appropriate. However, either type of cipher can be used in virtually any application. Okay. And there are attacks on stream ciphers as well, like as repetition attacks or insertion attacks. Uh, so if a key stream is used, attacker can obtain uh, XORs of two plain text and see like how things are repeating for the repetition attack. Uh, and then insertion attacks, um, like a chosen byte can be inserted by the attacker. Um, like for instance, email sent with a new message number and you can see like how those are encrypted and uh, try to decrypt that message. Okay, so that is basically the end of uh, 
uh, what's that symmetric cryptography okay and then in the lab we will look uh, or delve deeper into this so in the book read the sections on uh, uh, symmetric cryptography okay so that is all for the lecture